Hey, BlackRock, I don't, I don't know if you, uh, if you pick up on this, but um, these students up here who are doing this and the students doing the tech in the back and the lights and all that kind of stuff, man, they do it better than a lot of churches do around the country, and they just killed it up here this morning. So can we, yeah, so good. World changers. You know, I've been in student ministry for the last uh, 16 years full time. And, you know, I count it pure joy, and I'm not just following James 1 where it talks about counting it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, but I count it joy and a privilege and an honor to shepherd these students, to help them become the men and women that God wants them to be. And God is in the business of changing lives, and he's doing it at BlackRock, and he's doing it in our student ministry. But here's the thing. This does not happen by accident. This happens through the work of the Holy Spirit. This happens through the power of God's word. This happens in the context of relationships. It happens over time. And I believe with all that I have, that God desires for students to thrive in their teenage years, not just simply survive. God wants more for them than simply being you know, good and behaving and doing well in school. He wants to use them to bring revival to this town, this county, this state, this nation, this world. This stage was full of world changers. And that's what God wants to do in the hearts and lives of students. The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, he says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You know, coming into this room on a Sunday morning is a great and necessary thing for our souls, for our spiritual growth. I mean, the corporate worship and the teaching is a great thing. But it's not in this room that you can motivate and encourage one another. Now, you might get motivated and you might get encouraged but see, the type of relationships where you can give that back happens in the context of community, not just sitting in a room. You know, I've had parents tell me over the years that I've been doing this, that, well, for one reason or another, maybe it's, you know, school or, or busyness or, or Sunday morning is, is sufficient that they don't need to be uh, plugged in to our student ministry, but can I tell you, if you are a student in this room and you know Jesus, regardless of whether you feel like you need to be a part of this church or this student ministry for yourself, maybe it's a question of maybe, maybe this student ministry needs you. Because see, God has given each one of you, each one of us who knows Jesus, he gives us gifts, talents, passions, abilities that are part of the body of Christ. We all have a role to play. And when we all do what God is calling us to do, that's when the body works the best. And so students, if you're here, you're like, well, I don't really feel like I need that. Well, maybe it's not that, and I could, we could debate all day about that one. But maybe it's we need you. Maybe we can reach more students for the gospel for Jesus if you're there. Maybe you could truly make a difference in the life of somebody else. So parents, if you're in this room, I wanna challenge you. Come out to our student ministry, parent, open house, the Tuesday, the Wednesday after Labor Day. Seriously, break out your phones right now. And I want you to put this in your phone, in your calendar and save the date. Come find out what we're all about. Come meet the leaders that are going to be pouring into your students over the next coming school year. Be there. You know, it doesn't matter if your student is super involved and they're here every week or if they haven't come at all or somewhere in between. Maybe they even stopped coming. This is still for you to find out what's happening. Man, wow. Um, that was just a freebie. So... Uh, Freebie or shameless plug, you're welcome either way. So um, let's pray. God, I just thank you so much, God, for your love and your goodness to us. God, I thank you that, Lord, that you know us, the depths of our minds, the depths of our hearts. And God, you know that sometimes there is this collision that happens, and sometimes it's not pretty. 
when our emotions and the truth of your word collide. So God, I pray that this morning, God, that your word would speak. God, that there would be, I pray, hope and life, the fullness of life that's found only in you, Jesus, that comes out of this place this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So it's Father's Day, right? right? And appropriately, we're gonna talk about feelings, right? Because that's what every man loves to talk about is his feelings. But see, we are these created beings that have been given the gift of emotions. No, it's not the result of the fall or sin entering the world, okay? God created us with emotions, the ability to feel. It's one of the things that separates us from the rest of the created order. And what makes us part of the image of God is our ability to have emotions and to feel. Things like happiness and joy and pain and sorrow, excitement, dread, right? Whatever it might be, it's how God has made us. We have a heart that feels, because in our culture, the heart is the seat of the emotions. At the same time, we have a mind that can think and know. Though sometimes I do wonder if certain seventh grade boys have the ability to think, but that's okay. Okay. But like I just said, we have a heart that feels and a mind that thinks. But the reality is there are times in our lives when these two things don't jive, but one of them will always prevail. There are times when what we, what we think and what we feel, they just don't line up with each other. The question is, what do we do when these opposing forces, when we face those opposing forces? What do we do? What do we do in that moment, whether that moment is just a particular moment or it's been going on for what seems like forever, What do we do when our feelings don't jive with the truth that we know from God's word? If you have your Bible or your device, I want to encourage you to open up to Psalm chapter 13. Psalm chapter 13, and that's kind of where we're uh, camping out today. Starting in verse one, during the whole chapter, it's only six verses, so you're okay. Here we go. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. You know, this scripture here is so honest and authentic. Here we have David, a man after God's own heart, pouring out his heart to God and how he's feeling. David felt like God was abandoning him. We don't know the certainty of the timing of this psalm, but we do know that there are many times in David's life where he felt he faced extremely, insanely difficult circumstances, where people that he loved and trusted were betraying him, times when people that should be for him were trying to take his life. There's just a lot of times that David is facing difficult things, and we know that this instance was not just a whim of a thing. It wasn't something that went away after a day or two. We know that it was, taught, it was hard and it went on for a while because of the repetition of the words, how long? How long, God? Where are you? Where have your blessings gone? How long do I have to try to figure this out? How long will I lose this battle? How long? Because of his circumstances or because of maybe a lack of sensing God's presence, God seemed to have abandoned him. He felt like he was all alone. Then verses five and six come, and they seem totally not to fit. They seem so contrary to the first four verses. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. I mean, what just happened here? This seems like a complete 180 from what Jesus, from what David was just saying here in those first four verses. He went from mourning and crying out to all of a sudden praising God. This psalm, I think, is a great example as to why I, I believe that David is a man after God's own heart. Because David was so honest without, with how he was feeling 
And yet, he, how he ended Psalm 13 was not a denial of those feelings, but an embrace of the truth instead. We can learn from this. We see the, and we can find the ability here to come to a beautiful collision of feelings and truth. The first thing we see is that feelings are real and a good thing. As Christ followers, God is not calling us to deny all our feelings and stoically follow him in full denial or ignorance of our feelings. That's not what he's calling us to. In fact, as Christ followers, we're called to follow Christ, right? We're called to imitate him. And in his time here on this earth, Jesus showed us something very contrary, that he was someone who had emotions. His heart broke. See, when Jesus, uh, when he went to, uh, when his friend, very dear friend Lazarus died and he went to comfort uh, the family and friends of Lazarus, like his heart broke, he wept. Even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he wept at the heartbreak of his friends and those he loved. He wept at the effects that sin had had on his beloved creation. He had righteous anger whether it was at the religious leaders of the day or perhaps with the money changers flipping the tables over in the temple's outer, outer court, there were times when Jesus was not a timid dude whatsoever and he had anger and he got fired up. He was full of compassion. As the crowds would gather around him, as, as they would come and stay way longer than they had food, or they would come even when he was trying to sneak away to just get a few moments of quiet with his heavenly father. Instead of responding with annoyance, he would respond with compassion because they, to him, were like sheep without a shepherd. He got frustrated. Time after time after time of, of failing to grasp and understand what Jesus was trying to tell them. There were times when Jesus was like, man, how long do I have to put up with this wicked and twisted generation? He was frustrated. These are just a few of the many emotions that Jesus showed. God has given us emotions that drive us to love to have compassion for others, to cry with others, to celebrate with others. Like we're gonna do next Sunday, Baptism Sunday, because this place better erupt when they hit the water back behind me. God uses emotion to help us have a deeper experience of intimacy with him, to, to instill within us a passion that we can run after for his glory but emotions, let's be real, they're not always a friend of the truth. There are times when our emotions support, encourage, push us to walk after what Jesus has for us, but there are times when our emotions stand in complete contrast to that. Like David had in Psalm 13, when, when our feelings don't line up with what we know to be true, what we know of God's word. But because our feelings are an overall a good thing and they're a gift of God, that it's part of how we're an image of him, we have to still recognize that there are times when our truth stands in contrast to feelings. When truth stands in contrast to feelings. I mean, what do we do when what we feel doesn't line up with God's word? Perhaps we feel like David, like God has abandoned us. That we prayed and prayed and prayed and yet all we get in response is what seems like silence. Or we, or we feel this draw towards a certain way of life with a certain, like a reoccurring desires and yet we know that's contrary to what God's word says. Or perhaps we know we, know we should forgive but our heart screams with anything but forgiveness. This is normal. Because see, as sinful human beings, we can't fully grasp the entirety, the eternal uh, view of what life is doing and what, how life is playing out. And there are gonna be times when our emotions just don't line up with what God says, God's word says is true. And I think we have an greater, even greater challenge in front of us today because in our culture today, there is this thought that, man, you just need to um, 
uh, feelings or truth. You just need to, hey, what you feel, that's true for you. Follow your heart. Do what feels right to you. And can I tell you, this goes contrary to all logic. In fact, it is contrary to almost all authority and laws. It's contrary to almost all governances out there that say, yeah, you know, you can't do whatever you want, whenever you want, whatever you feel and desire. It's why we have policemen, right? You can't do that. It's not necessarily what is right. And it's that whole idea of, man, I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna do what I feel. I'm gonna follow that as truth that I have seen tear family after family apart. Our hearts can be a dangerous thing. Jeremiah 17, nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But guys, there are times in our, in our lives where our hearts and what we feel does not completely line up and actually can steer us away from what is true. Perhaps you know the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis. Joseph is Jacob's son. He was his dad's favorite. I know there are no dads with favorites in this room, right? But he was his dad's favorite and his brothers knew it and they hated him for it. In fact, because of that and a few other things, they decided they were going to kill him. But instead, they didn't do that. They ended up selling him into slavery and faked his death. Then many years later, after a series of mostly unfortunate events, Dave, uh, Joseph finds himself miraculously second in command of all of Egypt, one of the most powerful nations at the time. God did, get, did this so he could show Joseph his plan that he could show Joseph that there was gonna be a famine that was gonna last for seven years that was gonna consume everything and if something was not done, it was gonna consume everyone. And in this time of the famine, Jacob and his family, Joseph's family, they ran out of food. Jacob heard that there was food in Egypt and so he sent his sons to Egypt to get food. All except Joseph who he thought he was dead and Benjamin, Joseph's little brother, because I think he was scared to lose him too. And so the brothers went down and uh, Joseph recognized them. They didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. And so they bought their food. He gave them money back. He kind of set them up like thieves and they got him. They caught up to him, brought them back to Egypt. Uh, they put, he held Simeon hostage until the rest of the brothers bought, brought back Benjamin to see Joseph to collaborate their story. Probably not the first time a sibling has held another sibling hostage to get what he wants. But when Jacob hears about all that's happening, when his sons return, here's his response. Genesis 42, 36. Their father Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. Jacob's giving up. He feels that everything is going against him and yet God is using this very thing to bring salvation to him and his family. He thinks everything's against him and yet everything's actually going for him. The reality is there are times when what we feel does not line up with the truth. So what do we do when that happens? What do we do when that take, takes place? How do we respond when truth and feelings collide? David in Psalm 13 sets an example for us here of what we are to do, what we're feeling stands in contrast to what we know to be true. We must hold our feelings in light of the truth, not truth in light of feelings. There's a great poem by Martin Luther, Luther and it says this, for feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. Though all my heart should feel condemned for want of some sweet token, there is one who is greater than my heart, whose word cannot be broken. I will trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. For though all things shall pass away, his word shall stand forever. We all know that when it comes to our emotions or our feelings at a time, whether it's Moment by moment, day by day, year by year, those things change. And to rely on those as our foundation is very scary. But God's word does not change. 
and stands firm. Check out the story about Mia, one of our graduating seniors who's up on stage here, and her journey with feelings and truth. So there was a time in my life, in my sophomore year of high school, when I had a lot of anxiety, and that anxiety caused me to feel really far from God. And with my feelings of anxiety, I also didn't know where to turn because I thought that my friends wouldn't, maybe wouldn't understand, and I didn't feel like God was with me at that point in my life. I felt really alone because of my anxiety, and those feelings kind of just led me to be in a place that was kind of dark and just stuck. But I think over time, I was, I just realized I was having these feelings, and nothing really was making them better. And I didn't know really why I was having them in the first place, so it wasn't something that I could recognize the problem and then fix it. But I think over time, I just would come to church, and I would come to Fusion, and I would say to myself, I know, I've been told that God is with me and that He loves me and He cares about me and He's with me even through my struggles, but I wasn't feeling that. Probably on numerous occasions, I had conversations with one of my leaders, Rachel Donovan, and she reminds me all the time, even to this day, um, the truth that God has for me. And I think that probably hearing those words from her on multiple occasions uh, just kind of reassured me that my feelings weren't reflecting, I guess, uh, the truth that God has for me. So after I realized that you have to follow the, what you know is true and not uh, what you feel in the moment, I think I was able to recognize kind of this idea in our culture that we're supposed to follow our feelings and we're supposed to follow our heart. And yeah, that's kind of what we're taught from a young age in the American culture. And I was able to see how that's kind of backwards and that when I go to make a decision or I'm in a situation that I'm gonna react to, then I can look at that and I can see how I feel about the situation or about what I have to decide and say that I could react in a way that reflects the way I'm feeling in that moment, which could be hurt or angry, or I could choose to react with what I know is true and that would reflect something that's more loving or something that is more full of grace. So now I think that God has taken my fear and my anxiety and my feelings of nervousness and replace them with this peace that kind of transcends any situation. And that peace comes from knowing that I can trust in the truth that he has for me. I have a set of binoculars up here. These are really high tech. Um, these are my four-year-olds, uh, Abigail's. And uh, one of the things I've always loved about uh, binoculars when my kids were young is they would always look through it the opposite way, right? They'd look through it and they'd put it up and they're like, and they'd like laugh and like different things. It's kind of silly. And they look at me and they're like, daddy, you're so small, right? And, and but, but what is a binocular for? I mean, binoculars are designed to bring things in view, to allow us to bring things to where we can see them clearly for what they actually are to identify what it is that's in front of us. But see, if we put those things out of order, instead of being able to see clearly what's going on, in fact, we have a distorted view of what's really happening. David in Psalm 13 was so incredibly honest with how he was feeling. He was doing what, what God told him to do, and yet he felt like God was abandoning him. And, and sure, he was concerned about what his enemies were doing, but more so than that, the thing that really bothered him was what seemed that God was not doing. There's one little word that kicks off verse five, a word that in scripture often is a beautiful thing. It's a word of transition, not just grammatically, but, it's a, the, but the word but is a transition here from fear to faith from questioning to claiming God's promises. David's circumstances hadn't changed between verses four and five. No, his perspective had changed. 
Instead of viewing truth through the lens of what he was feeling, he decided to flip that around and view the, what he was feeling through the lens of truth. Band, you guys can come on up this way. So when this collision of feelings and truth takes place, how do we respond like David did? First thing we need to do is flip our perspective. We gotta turn the monoculars around. God is greater than your heart. That was right in that poem by Martin Luther and it comes from 1 John 3, 19 and 20. It says this, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. See, if we realize that our hearts can be deceptive, that can lead us in the wrong direction, but that God's and his truth is greater than our hearts, then we give that truth the opportunity to lift us up out of the emotional storms of life that we face. John Piper said, my feelings are not God, God is God. My feelings do not define truth, God's word defines truth. My feelings are, are echoes and perception, or re, echoes and responses to what my mind perceives. And sometimes, many times, my feelings are not in sync with the truth. When that happens, and it happens every day to some measure, I try not to bend the truth to justify my imperfect feelings, but rather I plead with God, purify my perceptions of your truth and transform my feelings so that they are in sync with the truth. Second thing that we can do, not only flip our perspective, but we can look to God's promises. You know, sometimes explanations as to why things are happening or why we're feeling a certain way don't really help. Sometimes we don't even care because it just hurts. It's just hard. And we're not looking for an explanation, but we're desperate for a lifeline. I've seen so many students that stumble and fall and find themselves in a dark place. And it, you say, God's word can get you out, but God's word doesn't have to be just a reactionary thing. See, God has promises for our lives that we can clip into. So even when the floor drops out from underneath us, we don't come crashing down, but we stand firm on the promises of God. So take those promises, dive into God's word. Do it, get into God's word. Find those promises that he has for you. Proclaim them over your life. Memorize them, meditate upon them. Ask God for strength to trust them in those promises so that you can stand firm no matter what is being thrown at you. And when we do this, when we bring our circumstances and our feelings before our heavenly father with his uh, uh, an air of, of thanksgiving to him for all that he does for us. And when we do that, Philippians 4, 7 can take place where the God's peace that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Jesus. Third thing we need to do is find promise proclaiming people. Alliteration is a wonderful thing. But like Mia, who had a mentor in her life, who repeatedly would speak to her into her life of the promises of God, we need people in our lives that we can not only be fully honest with, with how we're feeling, but that they will continually, with compassion and grace, speak truth into our life. These are our life givers. These are the kind of people I talked about at the very beginning in Hebrews 10, 25 those that encourage us. When truth and feelings collide, something beautiful and life-giving can result when we choose to look at our feelings through the lens of truth. And this Father's Day, when we're talking about dads, you know what, there's a reality that this whole uh, thing of truth and feelings come into play. Because I bet there's some dads out there this morning that you're out here and you, man, you're man like, I, I failed. I'm failing. I never thought I'd be at the place where I am with my kids. I, I, I just want to give up. I swore I'd never get there. But I, can I encourage you today, don't give up. Because God's mercies are new every morning. 
And that the reality is that if you know him, he is making you into a new creation. That day by day as you submit to him, he's making you more and more like his son. Don't let your past define you, but allow the truth to fill you that you are a son yourself of your heavenly father who wants you to imitate him as being a dad who gives life. Don't let your heart condemn you. God is greater than your heart. It's never too late. And even if you continue imperfectly, maybe you start tomorrow, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. And then you fail. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep pressing in. Allow your kids to see your journey of God working in your heart. Because even as you are imperfect, there's a, there's a phrase that Matt Chandler says I love that says, where the ideal is lacking, God's grace abounds. But for some of you in here, and I have sat across from many a student, and this is the case, and I know there's adults in the same boat, that when we talk about fathers, that stirs up a bunch of emotion and pain because in some, in some way, to some degree, your, heav- your earthly father, your dad here on earth has failed you. And because of that, that emotion clouds your view of your heavenly father. Flip your perspective. See how and who God truly is. Dive into his word and see his goodness and his love. Yeah, your earthly father may have failed. And you know what? That may cause you crazy pain. But hold to the truth that your heavenly father loves you so incredibly much that he gave his one only son to come to this earth to die to set you free from sin to set you free from pain to give you life in him because that's the kind of God and father that he is we want to thank you for watching and listening to our sermons online and we hope that uh, you will be inspired to live more like Jesus through these please check out blackrock.org for more information about our church Know that you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And also uh, know that you can give uh, to BlackRock and to our ministry through PushPay, through our mobile app, and on our website. Your uh, donations and your support of our ministry allows us to have uh, these videos online and for us to impact our community.